Um, as you will notice, the place of gathering uh, of, for our church is different. And um, why we have done it that? Because um, why, why we have worked under pressure and we've been here hours until 12? Right, Livio? <laughs> Uh, made a financial sacrifice too. Well, because when we come here, this old building, when we are here, this old building morphs into God's throne room. We can't see Him, but He is right here. And we are here to worship Him, to, um, to give Him our best, to give Him our life, our worship, our songs, everything. He deserves our praise, praises. We live in, in beautiful houses. I hope so. I do. But for almost five years, we worship in this place being almost indifferent how it looked. Um, the proper time came and we've done something about this and because we want to change something. And not just the building, okay? We need a start, we need a fresh start to think about the people that are passing by here. And they look at us and what they are doing here. Um, well, we started uh, with the place of worship, but we need to change our entire attitude toward God. We do. I need to change my attitude toward God. Um, and I hope and I pray that this is just the beginning. And this is an important year for our church because we want to outreach more and to go and to know more people by the same standards. Not just God, know God, love God, serve God, but know more people and love more people and serve more people. Um, and uh, to make a difference, okay? To make a difference, it's the opposite of indifference. To be indifferent is to make not a difference at all. It's like, so what? But to make a difference is to change something. And to change something, first of all, in order to change something, you need, in order to change something, you need to change yourself, to let the Holy Spirit of God change you. Um, I think it's better to let uh, the Holocaust uh, survivor and Nobel Prize winner, Elie Wiesel, to define indifference for us. He said, uh, well, in, in, in spring of 1944, he was deported to Auschwitz together with his family and he was selected by SS Dr. Mengele, or how is that said, to, to forced labor. In January 1945, he was moved to Buchenwald and, and he lost all his family. In April 1945, he was liberated by the Americans and he, he has seen the, the, the whole indifference in the Nazi um, death camps. And this is his de definition. In a way to be indifferent to that suffering is what makes the human being inhuman. Indifference, after all, is more dangerous than anger and hatred. Anger can at times be creative. One writes a great poem, a great symphony, one does something special for the sake of humanity because one is angry at the injustice that one witness, witnesses. But indifference is never creative. Even hatred at times may be elicit a response. You fight it, you denounce it, you disarm it. Indifference has no response. Indifference is not a response. Indifference is not a beginning. It is an end. And therefore, indifference is always the friend of the enemy, for it benefits the aggressor, never his victim, whose pain is magnified when he or she feels forgotten. The, polit the political prisoner in his cell, the hungry children, the homeless refugees, not to respond to their plight, not to relieve uh, their solitude by offering them a spark of hope. I like this. A spark of hope is to exile them from human memory. 
And in denying their humanity, we betray our own. Indifference, then, is not only, and I love and I want to emphasize, is not only a sin. It's more than a sin. Indifference is a punishment. Um, a case of alarming indifference can be found in the scriptures, in the book of Haggai. His name is very interesting, Haggai. Um, let me introduce you to this and, and, and then we will um, read a little bit from it. In, in 538 BC, Cyrus the Great gives an edict that the temple in Jerusalem to be uh, rebuilt and worship to be restarted. The book of Ezra, if you are interested, read the book of Ezra, gives all the details about returning, the, the Jews returning uh, to their land under Zerubbabel. By the way, his name, Zerubbabel, means born in Babylon. That's why Babel at the end. Born, so he's a prince, but he was born in captivity. Uh, he didn't I mean, everything he knew about Jews was from their history, from the books. But now, he's the one bringing them back, almost 45,000 people, something like that. Because of the pressure uh, that was uh, there, they, uh, they started to rebuild the temple, but because of the pressure, they stopped. They built the altar, they laid the foundation for the temple, and all the nations surrounding, they, because it was like a no man's land, they were intimidating them, and they stopped. By the way, they stopped for 16 years. So, under Cyrus the Great, they were uh, challenged to come back and rebuild the temple, and the temple stopped. This rebuilding would start uh, stopped for 16 years. Um, times were of confusion when Haggai and Zechariah brought prophecy from God, saying. Look, come back and, and restart their, uh, my, my temple. Um, they start to preach, and their sermons were not abstract. Uh, their sermons were in a, uh, for a time of crisis, and uh, this time was like a political crisis, economical crisis, um, and social crisis. So imagine... Everything was hard, and now you hear two prophets saying, Come on, guys, let's rebuild the house of the Lord. If you would be uh, the, uh, the Jews at that time, you know why they are called Jews? Because from Exa, from, the ba from Babylon, just two tribes came back, Judah and Benjamin. So the Jews, the, the southern kingdom, that's why the Jews... So if you be like them, what do you do? We are too busy, and it's it's we don't have money, we don't have time. It's not the proper time to rebuild the house of the Lord. So imagine these two guys, hey guy and the other guy, Zechariah, saying, "Hey, you should do this," and and they were confused. Now let's read um, the book of Haggai, chapter one. Um, Haggai chapter 1, the whole chapter, so raise yourself, or we'll, we'll uh, read a lot today. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day, so remember this first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak. The high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourself to dwell in your panel houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, you clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, said the Lord. 
You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth had withheld its produce. And I have called for a trot on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on that, and what, uh, on what the ground brings forth, on men and beasts, and all on all their labors. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God. And the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord, uh, their God, had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the twenty-fourth day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Uh, this is an interesting account of, of the rebuilding of the temple. By the way, this is the temple that Jesus ministered in. It was enlarged by uh, Herod the Great, but this is the beginning of the temple, the second temple. Well, I would like to talk to tell you a few, few things about the sin of indifference, okay? To be indifferent, it's a sin. Um, and in the first five uh, verses, you see the, uh, like an x-ray of the indifference in their lives and also in our lives. Um, verse 2, you see uh, who is, who are indifferent here? Well, everybody. Everybody. Um, the remnants of Israel, the whole people, but also the leadership. The leadership, were, they were indifferent um, to what they were indifferent to accept God in daily life in their daily life um, you live in a house but I don't God said you live in your houses but I don't my house is desolate um, they have placed their personal interest before God's interests and God said my house is in ruin and the word there means to be dry to be desolate, to be waste, not inhabited. My house is not inhabited. So I sent you back to build my house, but it's not the proper time for my house to be built. So your interest, my interest, and eh, they don't coincide. Even when the house of, oh, house of the Lord was in ruin, they felt no difference. So what? What's the big deal? Um, and then, in verse 2, you see the reason why. We don't have time. It's like today, right? <laughs> we don't have time. We are too busy. The time has not come yet. And this is not the language of dedicated people. They were like, yeah, sure, we have something else to do. The house of the Lord was the expression of their faith that God lives among them. And they said, uh-uh, no, it's not time. We don't have time for this. But yeah, God is our God. We are in a covenant with Him, in a covenant relation, but we don't have time for Him. He's not central for us. Um, now, verse 5 says why the cause of their indifference. Because their conscience was frozen was dead. Um, God said, set, set your hearts on your ways. It's an imperative. Like, consider your ways. Think of what you have done. Um, they didn't have time to reflect their state uh, because their life was so alert. Uh, the crisis was so deep and the house of the Lord was not rebuilt. So, eh, so what? 
Maybe you are in a difficult situation because you don't have time to reflect about your own life and of your relationship with God. But today's text is, is presenting that for us, is introducing to us the natural path of those who don't have time for God and for His interest. What happens to them? In, well, it was easy to be like this. In the beginning, you think that you can still postpone your relationship with God, and then because you, you are focused on your interest, you don't realize that the time flies. And yes, time flies. Next step is to freeze your conscience somehow, or to kill it, um, with the fact that it's not the proper time to give to, to, do, to give something to the, uh, the house of the Lord and or for God's mission. It's not time. We don't have time. The final stage of your hardening of your heart is when you think that, hey, others can do it. Why should I? I have so much to do. The problem is you are dead and you, are, you have no idea you are dead. You are indifferent. What brings life to your heart? Cooking? Culture? Sports? Computers? Education? Work? Money? When you talk about this, you are alive! Passionate! How about the relationship with God? Eh, that's for Sunday. You see the difference? You are indifferent, actually. Ah, it doesn't matter. What makes you alive is what deserves your worship. Actually, what makes you alive makes you worship. And you, you say, yeah, I worship God. But actually, you are worshiping something else. And it's not about you. It's about me, too. We are, all of us, we are in this. Uh, is there anything that gives you more energy in life? You give more effort, you give your time, you give your money to? Then this is your functional idol. You declare, you sing, you know, God is my God. But actually you serve someone else. Something else. This is your God, actually. We are able to say that we worship God and then worship something else. We are able to. Our heart tricks us. Um, think of one thing that, she, that gives you more energy than God. I'll give you 30 seconds. I'm not asking you to say it out loud, okay? <laughs> no. But, okay, 30 seconds. Think, think about it, okay? Ask yourself, what gives me more energy than God or His mission or His house? Think. Ten more seconds. could be a person, it could be you, could be your job, could be your interest, something else. But when you worship that thing or person, is your God. Okay, I, what I will ask you, just do this. If you already picture something, if you have something in your mind, raise your hand. Okay, thank you for thinking and taking time. Well, 30 seconds is not allowed, but, you know, it's okay. It's a good... You, you should go home and make a list with things that makes your life, you know, passionate and not God. And then, this is your idol. Uh, the lack of time is a problem of the modern man, and uh, time is made according to our priorities. If God is not number one in your priority, then He... Uh, 
he's somewhere, I don't know, maybe third, fourth, or not even among the ten, the first ten uh, things in your life. Um, God is not a passenger in your life that gets off in next, you know, next action, uh, or that can uh, uh, get crowded out of your life because you have too, too much to do or going on, and um, you need to clear out some stuff, and you clear out God. God is not a great garage sale option. God should be number one in our life. Should be. But it's not always. Um, well, this is how Haggai said, look, this is your problem. And I hope you already processed some thoughts about this. But number two is, how big is my problem? Well, first of all, there is a moral part of this. Uh, God is disturbed by their luxury they were living in. And maybe you think, why? I mean, it's wrong to live in panel houses? No. In Ezra uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, it says this. So they gave, I'm talking about the Cyrus the Great. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon, like quality, high quality trees, uh, timber, from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, and according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. So when they moved in the country, they brought wood with them, best quality, from Lebanon. Now, where is that wood? Where do you think is that wood? Yeah. Come on, think. Yeah. They said, and believe me, we are like this. They said, you know, I will borrow some wood from the Lord. And when is the time, I will bring it back. But you know what was the, their problem? There is no time. So, the wood, you know, Great A wood was in there. They paneled their houses. And they looking at the wood. I was like, man, this is a beautiful house I have. How about the uh, house of the Lord? Not the proper time. <laughs> so, um, they just borrowed from the Lord. But you see the moral problem here? They never borrowed, they just took it. And I don't think they were ready to give it back. It's no difference. I mean, God will not see that uh, as a problem because we are His people, right? We are His family. Um, and I don't know, maybe you think, why are you saying this to us? Because we are, you know, we are sacrificing for the Lord. We are here. But yeah, but sometimes, you know, we to take a credit and and you reduce, reduce your tithing because you don't have money anymore. Uh, um, you have uh, heard a dozen calls in the church about, you know, like a prayer meeting. Let's do a prayer meeting. Well, we don't have time. Oh, let's go out and, and spend some time together. Well, we don't have time. Uh, come here and let's do this. Well, we don't have time. You see, we are doing this. It's, it's, I, I, this is me too. I'm talking to myself. Sometimes we waste time just watching movies and we can do whatever we you know or play video games or I don't know what talking to some peers but if somebody will say come and let's have like two hours prayer oh man this is too much let's uh, let's uh, listen a sermon together oh man I don't have time uh, we are like this we are we are borrowing from God's time, thinking that we will give it back. And we are not. And we are not. Stop stealing from God. Stop treating God lightly. When maybe it's time to repent. Maybe it's time to surrender. Say, Lord, I... I'm like this. 
um, in verse six, uh, verse six talks about uh, an economical and national crisis, drought. God said, you have planted much, but harvested little. Um, the lack of welfare, you eat and never have enough. You drink, but you are never full. Uh, the lack of comfort, you put clothes on, but you are not warm. Inflash, inflation, you earn wages uh, only to put them in a purse with holes. You don't see that money uh, anymore. And um, they, they were not giving proper um, attention to the highest priority in their life, which is God. And they said, so what? We'll work more. And I will give more time to this. And finally it will work. And God says, I blow it up. Why? Well, my house. My house is desolate. And, and you are blind. You, you, you don't see this. It's nobody's fault. But you and me. We are not in a good relationship with our Lord. And He is sending us signals uh, about our situation. And we are too blind. We don't see it. Um, verse 9. A lot of expectations. Oh, I, I hope I, I will do more. And God blows it. I blew it away. We are so dedicated to our personal interest. You see what, what it says that um, you looked for much, great expectation, and behold, it came too little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? And you know why. Because of my house. And you see at the end of verse 9, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Actually, the, the, in original it says, each one of you runs for your house. It's like a, like a bodyguard that runs along the royal chariot. If somebody will shoot the president, they will take the bullet or the arrow. Um, and this is the image God uses here. So you are runners for your house. You take all the bullets. But you know what? There is no interest for me. Total dedication for personal interest, but not for God's interest. And they say, well, there's no difference. I run for my house. This is what the Lord likes. It's my family. But the Lord says, and how about the relationship with me? You forgot about that. So, we have great expectations. We have great plans for the future, for ourselves and for our families. But how about for the house of the Lord? And I'm not talking about this. You understand, right? It's not Burgas 104. The house of the Lord is our heart now. But this place is also needs to look nice. Because for a few minutes, an hour and a half, two hours, this place is the throne room, God's throne room. And this is why we, we did that. And if you read more, like after verse 10 to 15, God is ready now to confront their indifference. Um, and, and, and God is not confronting the, the sentence, but the cause. The cause was spiritual. The symptoms were physical, like the house. But the, 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 the root was in their heart. Instead um, of doing, you know, the working for your... Working your land, your garden, your family, 
You should be busy repenting. And God is in control. And he said, always, if you, if you read, it's like, I did that. I called that. I called the drug. I did that. And, and, and I am responsible for this. Um, and interesting, I asked you in the beginning of this text, do you remember the day when God started to spoke to them through Haggai? To the hand of the prophet. You remember the day? You, you can look in the Bible if it's not cheating. <laughs> it's the word of God. Could you tell me what is what day was that? In the second year of King Darius. First day of the sixth month. Could you tell me when they started to work at the, the end of the chapter? In the second year, when? 24th day Same month? Six months, right? What day? 24th. So, what was the difference? What they did before, between first day of the sixth month and the 24th day? The delay was pretty big, right? Like, God talked to them, told them what is going on, in the first day of the month. But they started to do something about it in, the, in day 24. I will tell you what happened. When God sent Haggai, it was the harvest time. They were too busy. <laughs> I mean, Lord, uh, right now we, we are gathering the fruit of our work. But it was pretty pathetic. Because it was draw, it was uh, probably the shaft where they're just little shafts. So was nothing. And day by day, day by day working, they realized, man, God is right. But you think they needed like 23 days to, to start doing something? God talks to our heart every Sunday here. And we let so much time. We're like that. Think about it. Until God will, will, will make us to understand. And then, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> For us, it took like five years to do these walls. <laughs> you see? Uh, don't, don't judge them. We're like them. God is dishonored when we live ruined deserts behind us. When he causes desert, and then he causes deserts behind, uh, uh, before us. So when we leave desert behind us, he caused desert be before us. But when we, we are called to bring life, not death, not desert. So, um, for, for the sake of our awakening, God sometimes acts so unexpectedly because you have chosen to come to church today. God is very serious about waking you up and me, us. The question is, do you want to be waked up? Do you understand what, why is he doing this? Are you ready to surrender your life under God's authority? Again, it's not about these walls. Is about the house of the Lord in our heart. He lives right there through His Holy Spirit. And He wants to challenge us. If you started with this, then do the next step. Go out. Talk to your friends. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Maybe they, they experience the same thing. Drought, inflation, and you could say, look, this is because you don't treat God with respect. Look what happened in my life. And when I started to do this, it's God at work. God changed my entire life. But the question is, are you ready to surrender? Are you ready to repent? Uh, 
Would you want your friends to meet God and have their lives transformed? Then you must to be the first transformed. This is the reason we, our church is called Be One. Be the one. Let God transform your heart, His house in you, and then transform others. Someone said, don't be afraid of enemies. At worst, they may kill you. Don't be afraid of friends. At worst, they may betray you. Be afraid of, ind of the indifferent. They don't kill you. They don't betray. But with their consent are done many killings and betray betrayals. So, uh, indifference is not a small and important, an important and light sin. Indifference will kill you softly. So, think about this. It's not about the walls, although we did that, and it's a, it's a good start. But for our church, the next step is to do God's will according to the what you see there in the scripture. He wants others to come and to be discipled and to understand that God prepares something bigger for them. Vienna is a wonderful place to live in, right? Yes. <laughs> you are not convinced. Oh yeah, it's like the best. But imagine, God's purpose is not Vienna. It's the city of God in the future, when we will live for an entire eternity with Him. This is God's purpose with us and with our friends. So, uh, if you need some time to repent today, I think we can do that. Let's spend some, we have enough time, let's spend some time in, in surrender to, <coughs> to surrender something to Him. Maybe our indifference. It's a, it's a serious sin. Uh, maybe it's our pride. Maybe it's our faulty thinking saying that we don't have time for the Lord. I don't know. But I hope the Holy Spirit of God talked to your heart and you know what to tell God. So let's take a few minutes. And each one of us will pray to God directly. And then we'll see.